I don't think very many blockchains actually had a lot of users and traction. You can see that through the fact that, you know, you don't really have any congestion or challenges with network stability. Developers are going to go where users are. You may consider building out your own L2 rollup and having it be more Solana aligned. Thank you so much for making time to talk to us today. How are you? Doing great. And yourself? Oh, good. Thank you very much. How was your uh, talk just on the main stage now? Oh, it was great. It was great sharing a little bit more about why we chose to build on Solana and uh, a little bit about my journey into Web3. How did you get started, actually? What was, the, what was the sort of inflection point where you decided, I'm going to do this full time? Yeah, well, I got into crypto through the tennis industry, actually. So I built out a online virtual tennis business. And through that experience, I realized how how like the biggest barrier to to like supporting a global network is actually uh, uh, transfers of of assets. And so like through that experience, I kind of backed into the fact that blockchains had this product market fit around value transfer. And so uh, sort of through that experience, I realized that I wanted to explore the blockchain space and then went in all, went all in. And what brings you here today to the Almaty Innovation Summit? Yeah, so uh, with building out Termina, we're really looking to support developers all around the world. And so we want to be able to provide a forum at, where we sort of evangelize what we're doing and how you can get involved in Web3. So, you know, we think it's really critical to uh, attracting more Rust developers into the Solana ecosystem, as well as uh, looking for entrepreneurs that are hungry to build out uh, new products that need to utilize customized, customizable Solana block space. So Kazakhstan seemed like the right place to do that, or was there another reason why you were here? Yeah, so you know, I kind of got, I kind of like, uh, how do I say, got interested in in uh, exploring Kazakhstan through my first business, as there were a lot of tennis players in the area that like, uh, like kind of drew me to Kazakhstan. And uh, when I was when I you know got into to Web three full time, I came here and was really impressed with a lot of the OG mining community, the Bitcoin mining community, um, and uh, decided to spend more time exploring the developer community out here and um, why entrepreneurs like like to use block blockchains out in Central Asia. Interesting. We are going to talk about the the mining scene here because I think uh, I, I get the impression talking to people that it was quite a, quite a critical. Uh, point in the development of the country's crypto ecosystem. But before we get there, can you tell me a little bit more about what you're building and what you do day to day? Yeah, absolutely. So I am the CEO of Nitro Labs and we're building Termina, which is effectively one-click Solana rollups. So our mission is really to, to help scale the SVM by providing builders that need, a, need to utilize their own custom Solana block space an opportunity to very, edil, very easily uh, create that infrastructure. So we can handle the infrastructure and you can build out a application or a product on top of that block space. Specific use cases or is it a, is it a general sort of uh, general purpose solution that you're building? Yeah, so we are building out a general purpose rollup solution. Uh, however, most builders are interested in utilizing it for specific use cases, um, such as building out trading platforms. What what makes it uh, what makes trading platforms require a rollup, for example, on on Solana? Yeah, so a lot of builders have pivoted into building out their own trading platforms as a result of congestion on mainnet. So uh, you know this is a great problem that Solana has because it has so many users um, and is still in beta, where there are times when uh, the chain has performance issues and the 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 challenge of getting transactions to be able to like land on the chain has led to the applications that are building on top of them uh, losing users. So a lot of these builders are transitioning or migrating into building out their own network extensions um, where they have more control over that block space and can ensure that users have a great experience on their platforms. So we see uh, you know, novel use cases within trading digital assets uh, for, you know, customizable Solana block space for privacy needs. Uh, maybe you're an enterprise that wants to like control which users are able to, to come onto your blockchain and also maybe control the information that's on that blockchain, mm -hmm. um, as well as potentially deep end solutions where uh, you might need to make chain modifications in order to better support the physical nodes that you have set up. Interesting. Is, is, there a, is there a sort of timeline or a time horizon rather that you think that Solana as an ecosystem is going to get to such a point where there's going to be so much congestion in its current configuration that we will need various um, specific rollups. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we've sort of reached we've sort of reached that like critical uh, tipping point where uh, a lot of the overall 
blockchain community is seeing that Solana is really the one rival to the Ethereum ecosystem as well as the EVM. And so, you know, last quarter there was significant uh, congestion challenges, and um, you know that's led a lot of builders to kind of pivot into building out their own uh, L2s, so SVM L2s. And, and beyond trading, for example, you mentioned Deepin, but can you give me sort of a slightly more specific uh, example or use case um, that would necessitate, uh, you know, rollups on Solana? And do you think we're going to see more of them? Yeah, I certainly think that we're going to see more of them because, uh, once again, I think over time, users or builders have kind of realized that Solana is like built infrastructure that that uh, users want, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, developers are going to go where users are. Yeah. Um, as far as like more specific use cases, I think any sort of data use case where you're going to have a ton of it, a ton of uh, transactions or data that you need to process will eventually move and rotate into kind of needing its own L2 solution. So, uh, you know, for things like AI, uh, where there's significant amount of data ingestion and you need to you need to be able to validate that type of information on chain, you may consider building out your own L2 rollup and having it be more Solana aligned. So uh, Grass Network is an example of a AI blockchain solution mm -hmm. that they've where they've effectively started out by building out an L2 that utilizes the SVM, um, and that's you know as a result of kind of the need to have uh, more block space uh, because they're ingesting so much data through their node network. Clear. And if we think about the sort of funding that goes into this, um, are, are VCs typically, in your experience, really interested in funding roller projects on Solana or? Is, is that something that's going to pick up over time, do you think? Yeah, I think there's been uh, significantly more interest in funding kind of Solana L2s recently. Um, I think the overall idea of kind of abstracting away the SVM and, uh, you know, separating the execution layer uh, is something that was previously contrarian. And now that you have, I think, at least 20 plus projects that are trying to utilize the SVM in order to build uh, out new solutions for users. So I think it's moved from being kind of a contrarian view as a result of like Tolly's vision for having a globalized state machine um, to to now where you know the SVM has a kind of pro prolifer proliferated as a smart contract language and um, as a tool to build out a useful um, useful high performance uh, block space and, and blockchains and so now you kind of have the community that's kind of creating the SVM as a universal smart contract language. And uh, as a result of developer interest, you have investors that are uh, looking to looking to pile into different types of SVM solutions. Right. Listening to you explain that makes you know all the sense in the world. But to your point about it being previously contrarian, there's a lot of people that would still argue, you know, Solana has this monolithic sort of L1 configuration. And the idea that L2s are, are necessary may be uh, it, it's lost on people to a certain extent, right? People would probably question it and say, do we really need, you know, roll-ups on Solana? So given that you've explained it and it now makes sense to me, how would you respond to that question of um, people not really understanding that it used to be contrarian? Yeah, so it used to be contrarian uh, as a result of the fact that I don't think very many blockchains actually had a lot of users and traction. Um, and you can see that through the fact that, you know, you don't really have any, like, congestion or uh, challenges with network stability. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there was a ton of like, let's say blockchain sub, uh, block space, but like less demand. Um, mm -hmm. And Solana's proven like if you build something that users want to use because it's fast and affordable to use the chain, you start to have situations where you have issues with congestion. And, uh, you know, that, that leads to needing to have more block space, hence building out what we're building with Termina in order to provide really great on-chain experiences. Um, additionally, I think through smart wallets um, and improvements on the uh, the user interface aspect of blockchains as well, over time, like these challenges of having uh, separate Solana L2s becomes less of an issue um, as a result of you know Solana building out this vibrant network, and now it's very easy for people to understand how to switch using like say Backpack or Squads or Phantom, mm -hmm. being able to switch networks to do one specific thing on another on another network. So I think, uh, you know, uh, initially it made sense to scale a vision around a monolithic chain. And now you're seeing this com this kind of intersection between monolithic and modular solutions where you I see an integrated future where you have these types of solutions that people know how to use because they're so used and so they're so used to utilizing Solana tech 
And now it's like very easy for them to migrate or to, to very quickly utilize um, Solana network extensions in order to do uh, in order to utilize other products that they want to use, like a perpetual exchange or like a deep end network where um, it's very simple for them. And it's not uh, you don't have these like uh, challenges that you see with uh, other with other uh, roll up solutions. Right. You mentioned there that you know Solana's got this vibrant network and, and vibrant ecosystem. I'm curious, have you experienced any Solana-based projects here in Kazakhstan or other people that are building on Solana or people that are you know uh, affectionate towards it or evangelists of Solana? Is there a Solana network here in Kazakhstan? Yeah. So I think um, we have contributors that are part of uh, part of the Termina team that are that are really growing and helping scale out the Solana community out in Kazakhstan. Um, we do see. Uh, um, there are global developers that have contributed to a lot of uh, well-known projects within the, the ecosystem. So I think that you uh, you have a, the early seeds of a of a community out here. Um, whether it's building out you know Telegram bots or wallets or even like kind of figuring out architecture for trading for trading solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you're starting to see like a tipping point where people uh, around the world are wanting to utilize Solana Tech and see the vision for. Uh, why choosing to build on top of Solana versus other options like like the EVM and Ethereum? What do you think makes Kazakhstan specifically uh, an attractive environment to be either as a business, as an established business, you know, migrating here? We've heard of some exchanges moving their headquarters here, or as an entrepreneur deciding to come and live here and, and maybe work for a company internationally, or indeed building a startup in in this country. What makes Kazakhstan an attractive environment to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the country is really like thinking about how to be a digitally first nation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the technology for like citizens is kind of ha has a kind of evolved into a in a way where, you know, they're they're really like digitally native. So they utilize their smartphones a lot and a lot of the ways that they register for agencies and, and record um, information is is through like uh, through digital solutions, so I think that they're really open-minded to uh, Web three and through uh, and to kind of new technology. Additionally, as we've talked about before, uh, there was a significant community of Bitcoin miners that came here as a result of various different factors. And so, you know, you had an initial community that was starting to explore blockchains early on, and um, so I think it's that combination of being really digitally native. Uh, being open-minded, as well as having like an original community that was exploring uh, why blockchains could evolve into being such a large, uh, a, such a large, uh, you know, uh, large opportunity, as well as a you know huge digital economy that we see. And, and if we think about the region as a whole, sort of zooming out from Kazakhstan for a second, do you feel that this country is is the most competitive, or the most attractive, or the most advanced in the way that it's sort of created this welcoming environment for companies, specific to crypto? Or do you think other countries in the region are maybe in a position to sort of take over that 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 attractiveness over time? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in Central Asia, I view Kazakhstan as being like in a leading position as a result of some of the agencies that they've set up in order to support, I would say, foreign entrepreneurs as well as explore um, explore Web three. So you know they're exploring the digital ten gay. Mm -hmm. They're exploring these types of uh, Web three technology, and uh, you know also. They're really open-minded to to working with exchanges, uh, centralized exchanges, in order to provide like regulatory clarity. Um, so I think that they're they're leading in Central Asia, and I think that there are other regions that are that they can draw inspiration from. So uh, you know, Dubai as well as Singapore, I think, are countries in the region that have done a really really terrific job of uh, attracting AI and Web three entrepreneurs as a result of kind of uh, their policies for. Uh, for uh, regulating the space as well as attracting uh, foreign entrepreneurs to come and set up uh, an entities within their within their nation states. I'm going to be really annoying here and, and ask you to, to give me like specific examples, if possible, of, of what in your mind makes Dubai and Singapore uh, attractive environments. We, we hear a lot about VARA and the MAS being, you know, organizations that bring regulatory clarity and they're, they're applauded for that. Um, so I'm curious if you can give me some specific examples of what Dubai and Singapore are doing right, and how Kazakhstan can sort of uh, emulate that going forward. From like a very simplistic argument here, I think one is like obviously Singapore and Dubai are English-speaking countries, mm -hmm. so it's like very easy for it's easier for, to understand, you know, sort of the application process for uh, for getting involved in in these countries. So I think that's one area, and the second would be just sort of like 
the speed at which you can set up a set up an entity and to be recognized by by these countries. I think like being welcoming and then also uh, having a universal language that you know having one of the primary universal languages that are spoken as like within like a like global commerce is quite important to uh, attracting and business entities to come and set up uh, their organizations uh, within within a country. That makes a lot of sense. Would you would you argue then, you know, based on the trajectory that uh, the UAE has followed and, and that Singapore has followed and the success that they've enjoyed, would you argue Kazakhstan is moving in the right direction in terms of creating that regulatory clarity? Yeah, certainly. I think that they've been really open-minded, once again, to bringing in some of the top Web3 organizations into the region in order to, to learn from, kind of learn from best practices. And those Web3 organizations are also, um, they're also, you know, big players within Singapore and Dubai. So, you know, if you're, you know, welcoming in those types of organizations uh, uh, and you're open-minded about kind of the trials and tribulations that they've had, um, I think that is like a step in the right direction. Additionally, I think that they are, um, they're actively encouraging um, more uh, foreign entrepreneurs to, to come in to, to consider um, spending more time out here. So I think that is also something that's particularly exciting. I guess the, the logical flip side of that argument or the, or the question that, that follows is what are they not quite doing enough of or what are they not quite getting right or how can they improve? How can Kazakhstan really cement itself as, a, as an attractive crypto blockchain innovation hub in Central Asia, but also going forward globally? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think one would be uh, probably establishing a, a digital nomad visa, like some of these other countries, um, with clear guidelines around how to apply and how you would how you would get involved. I think that's one way of like really more easily getting foreign entrepreneurs to get involved. I think that's like one area that I would really focus on. That makes um, sense. That would probably yeah. have a trickle down mm -hmm. effect of bringing in the right talent as well. Yes. Do, and are, then, are there any other issues that-, that hmm, Yeah, additionally, about? probably providing some uh, some regulatory clarity around like digital assets and um, ownership would also be quite helpful. So I think uh, the UAE and Singapore do a great job of that. And so I think take once again taking lessons from some of the top some of these uh, top uh, expat communities is also quite helpful in uh, being able to attract more foreign entrepreneurs to to spend more time in the, in the region and to kind of you know cement yourself as the leading state within Central Asia for Web3 or AI builders. They seem to be doing a pretty good job of it, talking to people and, and yourself today as well. It, it seems that you know across the board, people are quite happy with the general trajectory of the country in terms of uh, you know regulatory clarity. I'm curious if there's any sort of specific developments that you're looking forward to or any particular types of legislation that the, the government's working on uh, that we can look forward to hearing in the next 12, 24 months. Yeah, I don't know too much on as far as like what the government is focused on in, uh, in terms of encouraging the growth of growth within the the kind of sector. I think one thing that is uh, that they that they should focus on is, you know, attracting uh, and also developing native talent. Right. So uh, pushing for uh, more courses on um, software engineering and other tech focused um, tech focused careers. Um, as I think uh, they want to move into, you know, being having the tech sector be a meaningful aspect of their economy. And that's something that I've heard through friends that they are focusing on. So I think uh, I would encourage like continued uh, growth of uh, like tech education in order to kind of cement themselves into being kind of the top nation within Central Asia uh, for uh, for technology and for the advancement of AI within the region. And what are you working on day to day? Uh, what, what projects are you working on that we can sort of look forward to hearing updates about in the next 12 months? Yeah, so we're looking to uh, to have our DevNet out for builders to utilize our Solana network extensions platform uh, at the end of Q4. So we want to be able to attract these Solana builders to come and explore explore that the DevNet and to be able to test, uh, test out this uh, sandbox. Um, in order to build out their own unique custom Solana block space, um, figure out if there's bugs, figure out how they can optimize these things for their their core use cases and to support them. As we think that you know this is a really really exciting time for the Solana ecosystem, and we're going to have a ton of new and unique uh, use cases that come out of providing um, Solana network extensions. Certainly, and where can we follow along with those developments? Yeah, so you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, that's probably the best way to to check out what we're building. So that's at Termina XYZ 
on, on Twitter. Uh, we also have a Discord community that you can join and hop in and, and ask questions. So um, I would encourage you guys to check us out there. Thank you so much for making time to talk to us today. I appreciate it. Thanks, appreciate Thank it. You.